you. Oh, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Oh, what an awesome day. Here it is, Mike. Thank you, sir. So not only is it a beautiful day because we had Caleb Holloway's bar mitzvah. Great job, young man. Uh, but we, we are so blessed with uh, a special presenter today. This man flew in from Israel uh, Friday morning, got here Friday afternoon. So yesterday we had some good conversations. And I want to tell you how awesome God is. So we had a conversation about unity, about all the nations coming together to worship God. That was our conversation yesterday afternoon. And that was kind of what Caleb talked about today is the unity in God that we have for each other. And today when I invite this man up, he is, I believe, the first Orthodox Jewish man to speak from the Bema that we've ever had. So at this time, I would like to invite Mr. David Rubin up to the Bema. Come on up, David. So just so you know, Mr. Rubin was the mayor in Shiloh, Israel. So he was the mayor. A great man of God. And he has a phenomenal testimony and story about Shiloh Israel Children's Fund that he started and is running today. So without further ado, will you please stretch out your hands as we, we pray for David? Abba, this day, we thank you for this man. We thank you for all the glory that he gives you. We thank you for his heart in lifting up young children, Lord, and restoring their lives, that you would fill his cup to overflowing, and this message today that would go forth, not just here but in the future, will touch so many, Lord, that he continues to do it for your glory and for your kingdom and for your people, and we thank you for who he is in Yeshua's name. Amen. Jesse, you asked me today, can everyone hear me in the back? Okay. You asked me today what I thought of the service. And what I thought was that I heard a lot of words in Hebrew. And, you know, coming from Israel, you know, I walk in the streets of America, I don't usually hear a lot of words in Hebrew, but I did, and so there, there's one word that I heard a number of times, it's amen, okay, or amen, as they say in, in the regular churches, and, but a lot of people don't know what it really means. So I'm just going to share that with you, if I could take about two minutes at the beginning of my presentation. So the word amen, most of you probably think that it means so be it, or I agree, or if you're an attorney, I second the motion. But actually, it has a deeper meaning that comes from the Hebrew words. And the Hebrew letters of the word amen, which is aleph, mem, nun. The aleph represents the first, the first letter of the Hebrew word el, which means God. The mem represents, it's the first letter of the Hebrew word melech which means king. The nun is the, le is the first letter of the Hebrew word ne'eman, which means faithful. So when we say amen, we are actually saying God is a faithful king. Yeah. Amen. So when I'm, when I'm speaking to you about Israel, 
When I speak about Israel, and if we want to really understand what Israel means today, and if we want to understand Israel in the midst of everything that you hear in the news about Israel, when you hear about the terrorism, and you hear about the wars, and you hear about Israelis and Palestinians and the conflict and you don't understand anything unless you understand that God is a faithful king and there are some Israelis that still don't understand it and there are a lot of Jews in America who haven't even begun to understand it But those of us who understand it know that we need to move towards that. And it's like the, the young man who spoke earlier, who said very appropriately that if you don't have God, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you don't have God in the equation, you don't understand anything. So, you know, it says... To, to fix the world, to improve the world in God's name. And if you take away the in God's name, then you're going to miss out on what really needs to be done. So, yes, my name is David Rubin. I was born in a place called Brooklyn that you may have heard of. And uh, I grew up as an atheist. When I was in my 20s, the Almighty sent some messengers into my life from very disparate places. And I started to return slowly, slowly to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I eventually moved to the land of Israel. I moved to a place called Shiloh. Right? Many Americans know it as Shiloh. And that's understandable because there are, if I remember right, there are about 67 cities or towns in the United States called Shiloh. Now that says a lot about the biblical foundations of the United States of America. But I moved to the original Shiloh, which was the first capital of ancient Israel in the time of Joshua and Hannah and Samuel the prophet. Hey, many of you may know that a woman named Hannah came to Shiloh to pray for a son. The tabernacle that stood in Shiloh for 369 years the son who was born from her prayers, she named Samuel. Samuel grew up to be the prophet of Israel, the greatest of the prophets aside from Moses. He grew up into prophecy in Shiloh. And after Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines, he went on to appoint the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. David set up the unified kingdom in Jerusalem. His son Solomon built the holy temple in Jerusalem. And then it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then it was rebuilt by the exiles that had returned home. Some years later, it was destroyed again by the Romans. The Romans changed the name of the land from Israel and Judea, which it was at the time. They changed the name to Palestina, giving it a Roman derivative of the word Philistines, who were the arch enemies of Israel, along with the Romans. The way that you undo history 
is by changing the names. It's playing, it's what, what is known as semantic politics. And that's what was done. And the name Palestina, even though it was a fictional name, it stuck. And for 2,000 years, after the Romans exiled the Jews from the land of Israel, which, of course, is written about in prophecy in the book of Ezekiel. And it was called Palestine for all of those years. And then something very interesting happened. In the late 1900s, the people of Israel started to return to the land of Israel. They worked hard to rebuild the land of Israel. They drained the swamps. No, that expression, drain the swamps, does not come from Donald Trump. <laughs> they drained the swamps, and they started to rebuild the land of Israel once again. In 1948, the state of Israel was reestablished. All of the Arab, mostly Muslim nations that surrounded Israel attacked Israel, leaving it a small truncated state about the size of Delaware. The Arab nations took control of eastern Jerusalem. They took control of the place where the temple once stood, including the western wall. They took control of the strategic Golan Heights in the north. They took control of Judea, which is the region south of Samaria, south of Jerusalem. And they took control of Samaria, which is the region north of Jerusalem where Shiloh is located. They took control of the Sinai Desert and the Gaza Strip. And as I said, Israel was left a tiny, tiny state, which the former foreign minister of Israel called the borders of Auschwitz, naming it after the notorious Nazi concentration camp where millions of Jews were slaughtered because it was such a precarious situation. Then came 1967. All of the Arab nations attack again, promising to drive the Jews into the sea. But something different happened in that war in 1967. Israel recaptured the strategic Golan Heights in the north. Israel recaptured all of Jerusalem. Israel recaptured Judea and Samaria and Gaza and Sinai, all of this happened in six days and on the seventh day we rested. Amen. Okay, do I hear a hallelujah? So all of this happened in six days, on the seventh day we rested and then 25 years later, Israel negotiated a peace agreement. They called it a peace agreement with the people that were calling themselves Palestinians. Now, I have to tell you, my father-in-law grew up in the land of Israel. He was about 12 generations in the land of Israel. And he said when his... When, when, when he was a child, all of the Arab children would say, we're not Palestinians, don't call us Palestinians, you're Palestinians. That's a fact, historical fact that doesn't get mentioned in the media. And so, that, so in fact... The Palestinians that we talk about today are Arabs who live in the land of Israel, 
who decided that they needed an underdog identity and they would say, we are the indigenous people here, even though anyone who knows his Bible knows who the indigenous people are in the land of Israel. Uh, but, they, but it worked. And a lot of the world started calling themselves, calling these people Palestinians, saying they need to have a Palestinian state. And what came out of those peace accords were years and years of terrible terrorism, some of the worst waves of terrorism that Israel has ever experienced. We had many friends, many neighbors who lost their lives in terrorist attacks. I myself was coming back from Jerusalem one day. I had my three-year-old son buckled behind me in the toddler seat when suddenly the car was hit by a massive hail of bullets. The bullets were flying. I saw four orange sparks whiz past my eyes. The bullets had tracers on them. And then one crashed into my left leg. Blood started pouring out all over the place. And then I turned around to my son as I was trying to stop the bleeding in my leg, I turned around to my son and I asked him if he was okay. His eyes were staring straight ahead, wide open. His mouth was wide open. He looked like he was trying to scream or cry, but no sounds were coming out. I figured he was just in shock. I didn't see any blood on him. So I quickly turned the ignition to start the car. The car wasn't starting, it was dead. The terrorist is still shooting. I shifted gears, park, drive, neutral, anything that I could, trying to get the car to start, and it wasn't starting. The terrorist was still shooting. The blood is pouring out of my leg. Then suddenly the car started. It started as if it had never had a problem starting before. I hit the gas. I drove 170 kilometers, an, well, at 110 miles an hour hoping that I would soon get to an ambulance that would take me to the hospital. The whole time I'm driving, the car is shaking, probably from the speed I was going. My whole body was shaking, probably from the loss of blood. And it was a pretty cold night. It was the last night of Hanukkah. Finally, I get up to the next community up the road, which is called Ofra. I start shouting, ambulance, ambulance. I'm shouting to the guard at the gate. Now you have to understand, every community in Samaria has a metal gate in the front to keep out the car bombers. So I'm shouting to the guard at the gate, ambulance, please get an ambulance. He didn't seem to hear me. There was a young woman on the side of the road. She started jumping up and down, screaming, ambulance, ambulance, don't you hear? At that point, everyone who was within sounds reach came running up to the car, including a gas station attendant from across the street. He ran up to the car. He ripped off my shirt. He wrapped up my leg to stop the blood flow. He said, don't worry, I'm also a paramedic. I know what I'm doing. He handed me his cell phone. He said, quick, call your wife. My hand was shaking too much. He dialed it for me. I told my wife I'd been shot in the leg. Hopefully soon an ambulance will be coming to take me to the hospital and our son is okay, thank God. Well, at that moment, an ambulance zooms up. Two paramedics leap out of the ambulance. They run up to the car. One of them pulls him out of the toddler seat and cradles him in his arms, starts shouting to the ambulance. He's also been shot. He's been shot in the head. A bullet had gone into his head, we later found out, causing a, right where the, the skull meets with the neck, causing a skull fracture and internal bleeding in the cerebellum. Well, they, they quickly got to work on, on him. They wrapped his head with bandages. They put him in the ambulance and, uh, and uh, attached him to an oxygen, uh, an oxygen tank. And they, they whisked us to the hospital in Jerusalem. They get to work on us in the emergency room. The head surgeon comes up to me and he says, 
David, we're going to have to operate on both of you within, within half an hour. I just wanted you to know that. And there's someone else here who wants to speak to you. A man walks up to me who I'd never seen before. He says, I'm the public relations director for this hospital. I just want you to know that you are the 1,000th victim of terrorism to be hospitalized just in this hospital and just in the past year and a half. He said, I'm only telling you this because I want you to know that the media is messed outside this emergency room. They want to interview you and photograph you and your son since you are the 1,000th victim of terrorism. And I thought for a moment, and I thought of all of the friends, neighbors, teachers, family members who had been killed or wounded in terror attacks. And I said, you know what? You bring them in here. I have what to say to them. I've been telling this story ever since, but I, I tell this story not because of the trauma that we experienced, and Lord knows there are so many families that have suffered far worse than us. And I tell this story also not because of any political message that I have to deliver, even though I have my opinions. I tell this story because it's a story of miracles. And a person who has experienced miracles has an obligation to reveal that and publicize it. I was shot in my left leg, even though the terrorists were shooting from the right side, which enabled me to drive my automatic car to get to that ambulance. The bullet that went into my son's head and through his neck missed his brain stem by one millimeter. Well, those, those are the kinds of miracles that your average atheist will look at and, and, and try to rationalize away. But we know that there are hidden miracles that take a spiritually trained eye to see, and there are revealed miracles like that fire on the mountain on Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments, or like the splitting of the Red Sea. Well, there are revealed miracles today. On my fifth day in the hospital, I get a call from the car mechanic, a nice fellow named Erez from Jerusalem. He says, David, I just want you to know we have the car We've started doing the repairs. There are 49 bullet holes in the car. It's going to be a very difficult job, but we'll do our best. I said, Eris, I really don't care about the car. The car is not important to me anymore. My son is in the intensive care unit. He said, I'm just calling you because I have to ask you a question. Why can't we start that car? Now, I know that the car went completely dead when those bullets hit, and I know that I tried to start it over and over and over, and it wasn't starting. And finally, it started, and now he's telling me that they had to have it towed because they couldn't start the car. They had to have it towed to Jerusalem, and now they don't know why they can't start the car. Well, I have a confession to make to you tonight, and I'm not even Catholic. I've been a believer in the God of Israel for over 35 years. But up until that very day, I still had some of that old, shall we call it, New York City skepticism when it came to miracle stories. But I'm not a skeptic any longer because we were just lifted up on God's wings to get us to that ambulance. And I knew, I knew at that moment that God had planted a mission in me. I didn't know what it was. But I started to have this vision. After, after we saw my son came back from the hospital, we saw the trauma that he was experiencing. I started to have this vision of somehow blending together therapy with education to heal the trauma 
of the thousands of terror victim children And since then, there have been thousands more. But we have to heal their trauma. You know, we parents who moved to Israel or who moved to the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, which is what the world calls the West Bank, there's another fictional term for you. You won't read about it in your Bible. But we came from idealism. We came because we felt that we, we saw the prophecies. We see it in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Jeremiah. We read about how Israel will be brought back into its land and will rebuild it. And the greatest sign of the redemption is the, the, the flowers blooming again and the fruit trees and the fig trees and the pomegranate tree. All of this happening in the land of Israel today, it's happening. But our children didn't come for those reasons, and they need to be healed. And he, eventually, after a lot of thought and a lot of prayer, I started the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund for the purpose of healing the trauma of the terror victim children and restoring some of the lost innocents to their lives. And we've established programs with music therapy and art therapy and, and horseback riding therapy, animal assisted therapy, bibliotherapy, multi-sensory safe room therapy, all of this under one figurative roof, even though the horse farm is down the road a bit. And thank God today we have over 2,000 children on one campus and we are truly healing their trauma and rebuilding lives. And these children who have experienced the terrorism are growing up today after their treatment and their healing. They're growing up to be magnificent children of faith who are willing to sacrifice for the God of Israel. Now, I just want to say one brief thing before I show you a video about the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund. And I'm going to read it from the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 31, verse 2. From the distant past, God appeared to me. Now remember, Jeremiah was a prophet at the time of the first temple, the destruction of the first temple. I have loved you with an eternal love, therefore I have extended kindness to you. I shall yet rebuild you, and you shall be rebuilt, O maiden of Israel. You will yet adorn yourself with drums and go forth in the dance of merrymakers. You will yet plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria. The planters will plant and redeem. Now listen to this. For there will come a time when watchmen will call out on Mount Ephraim. Mount Ephraim is Shiloh. Arise, let us ascend to Zion, to the Lord our God. Now, who are those watchmen who will call out on Mount Ephraim? Okay, now we Jews, we're, you know, we Israelis, I should say, more accurately. We're big Zionists. What that means is that we believe that after 2,000 years of persecution and pogroms and holocausts, that we have to stand on our own two feet with the help of God and rebuild. So who are these watchmen? Well, if you look at the original Hebrew, you see that the original, that the original Hebrew, the word for watchmen is notzrim, which in modern Hebrew means Christians. 
So what is God talking about here? What God is saying is that Israel is not meant to do it alone, that, that Christians and those who believe in Yeshua as Messiah need to be taking an important supporting role in standing with Israel in these times. And sure, there, there are some people who have said to me, well, and Israelis, Israelis, and even Israeli rabbis, a couple of them, said to me, well, Notzrim doesn't really mean that because there were no Christians then. So I say, yes, but Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah the prophet wasn't speaking about the destruction of the first temple here. Jeremiah the prophet is speaking about what is happening today when Christians and Jews and everything in between are standing together with Israel. And, uh, and, and I know that you know, we're, we're still s small in numbers and, and you're still small in numbers, but it's growing. That connection, that partnership is growing. So, how, so in, in summing up, how do you stand with Israel? Well, there are three ways. One is by praying for Israel. And that's something that should be done regularly. God has these prophecies about Israel returning and rebuilding. And as it says in the book of Isaiah, Ki beiti beit And my house will be called a house of prayer for all of the nations. So we're all going to be praying there together. So... Number one, pray. Number two, make sure that the political leadership in the United States stands with Israel in biblically consistent ways. Okay, a Palestinian state in the heartland of Israel, in the biblical heartland, is not biblical. It's anti-biblical. And last but not least, partner directly with those who are active and sacrificing in the land of Israel. And of course, when I'm speaking in America, I'm speaking about the, the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund because as we saw today, as we saw this morning in the service, if you want to make a difference, you make a difference through the children. Because the children will grow up and be the next generations that are going to carry the baton, so to speak, and continue the rebuilding. So I'd like to, for you to see that video and then Afterwards, uh, I will be at, the, at my table in the back. I have a table with my seven books, uh, which, which kind of grew at, out of, they kind of grew out of this uh, whole thing of raising awareness of the Sheila Israel Children's Fund and the Terror Victim Children. And we have brochures out in the back on that table, and there is also a basket for donations, if you feel so moved uh, to come and stand with us in, in concrete ways. Okay, thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you. God bless Israel. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. About a year after my term as mayor, 
I was coming home from Jerusalem with my three-year-old son sitting behind me in the baby seat. Halfway home, the car was hit by a massive hail of bullets from Islamic terrorists on the side of the road. When the bullets hit, I was shot in the leg. Blood started coming out all over the place. My son looked like he was trying to scream or to cry, but no sounds were coming out. The car wasn't starting. It was completely dead, and the terrorists were still shooting. Finally, the car started. I zoomed ahead as fast as I could to get to the next community up the road where I hoped I could get an ambulance. I had been shot in the leg. My son had been shot in the head. The bullet had gone into his head where the skull meets with the neck, causing a skull fracture. The bullet had missed his brain stem by one millimeter. We had weeks of treatment in the hospital, two operations, and what we discovered afterwards was that my son was badly in need of psychological post-trauma therapy. And that's when I decided to start the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund because I understood the mission that God had intended for me was to heal the trauma of the terror victim children and to rebuild the biblical heartland of Israel through those children. center of ancient Israel. It was in Shiloh where the Ark of the Covenant resided almost 400 years. It's an enormous, awesome privilege that I can be here and be involved and have a part in rebuilding the biblical heartland of Israel through children. I thank God every day for that privilege. Through David Rubin's Shiloh's Fund, the quality of life for children has really grown over the years. It's really very good for all the children here for all the people of uh, Shiloh, not only Shiloh, but also the other places and our localities near Shiloh. For Shiloh as well, children fun for mm -hmm. all the fun things they do. The area of Samaria and Shiloh in particular has suffered from a disproportionate amount of terrorist attacks. There is hardly a child in Shiloh who has not had a parent or a sibling or a family member neighbor or a friend or a teacher who's been killed or wounded in a terrorist attack. Everyone has been traumatized to varying degrees. And for that reason, I understood that there was a need to establish a therapeutic educational complex that would heal the trauma of children. And it would be the best place to serve the needs of the children for the entire Shiloh Township and all of Samaria. מפגש מגיעים ילדים מכל הסביבה, מאזור שילה, אלי והיישובים בסביבה, ומגיעים גם מאזור השומרון ואזור בקעת הירדן. המטרה שלנו במפגש, תה טיפול שהוא קודם כל מאוד מקצועי, ודבר שני שהוא נגיש. הוא גם קרוב פיזית וגם נגיש מבחינה כלכלית לאנשים שמגיעים לפה. The kids who come to us for therapy, they talk so much about really like how much they're scared of the Arabs. What if an Arab comes through, comes through my window? What if I, he gets a, I get a rock thrown at me? A lot of times they have a need to discuss it over and over again, sort of to get it out of their system and maybe feel safe in a crazy situation. There's a lot of people who know the population, they come from the population, some of them have been in themselves מקרים של טרור או של טראומות שונות, ומתוך הידע המקצועי שלהם ומתוך הניסיון האישי שלהם, הם יכולים לבוא ולתת את הטיפול הכי מותאם למי שמגיע לפה. Therapeutic horseback riding has been recognized around the world as being a very effective uh, form of treatment for children, and therefore we've incorporated that into our program. When a child learns to ride on a horse, and does such things that he never did. His self-confidence grows. You can see children that comes here with a body like this, they come back with their, their, their back very straight. You can see through the body how they feel inside. The confidence grew. 
Ever since Sheila was reestablished 40 years ago, there has not been a high school here. 14 year old boy has to go away to a full time dormitory school. He doesn't get to see his family for sometimes weeks at a time. Many people recognize the need and the importance of this project, but government isn't supporting us yet. In order to get the project off the ground, we got the support of the Shiloh Israel Children's Fund, and that's what really helped us get started, because otherwise uh, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. This project is very important for me because I lost my son and now I have the uh, opportunity to build a high school for children here in Shilo. And this gives us a lot of comfort for me and my family. ניסו להוציא אותנו מכאן על ידי פיגועים וטרור, אז מאוד מאוד חשוב לנו להישאר כאן, ושדור ההמשך של הילדים, ושיתחנכו פה, ושיהיה פה היאחזות חזקה ב... באזור שילה. I think it's very important that there's uh, finally a shiva that's uh, close to home and we don't have to go somewhere far. I want to say thank you for all the people who uh, donated money to the, to the shiva that uh, don't live in the country, helping us a lot here. Uh, thank you very much. בזכות קרן שילו לילדי ישראל, אנחנו יכולים להגשים את החלומות של בית הספר ולהצעיד את הילדים שלומדים כאן, מעלה מעלה. יש לנו חלומות של דברים שאנחנו רוצים לעשות, וקרן שילו לילדי ישראל מאפשרת לנו, אם זה בהקמת חדר אומנות, שמאפשר לבנות לבטא את היצירתיות שלהם, את הכישרונות שלהם. אם זה בהקמה של מרחבי למידה, ללמידה אישית ופרטנית של הבנות. זה רייס, ובכל בקשה ובכל עזרה, קודם שאפשר לפנות לקרן שלו לילדי ישראל ולקבל שם את העזרה. I welcome the support of everyone who's willing to stand with us in this struggle as we rebuild the land of Israel, we rebuild the biblical heartland of Israel, and we do it through the children, through the next generation of Israel.